It is uh, my distinct pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Arnie Hendon. Uh, Arnie Hendon received his doctorate from Indiana University and subsequently worked for Goddard Space Flight Center, the Ohio State University, I guess that's the way we have to say it, <laughs> and the U.S. Naval Observatory as an instrumentation specialist. He was the director of the American Association of Variable Star Observers for the last decade of his career, retiring to New Hampshire, where he runs several automated telescopes. He is the author of a textbook and several hundred scientific articles and has given lectures worldwide. Arnie, I think you said a few hundred uh, lectures and, and, and presentations. Uh, Arnie has been a longtime promoter of professional and amateur astronomer collaborations and has been one of the premier mentors of amateur astronomers, especially those interested in variable stars and minor planet astrometry. Arnie and his collaborators and volunteers are responsible for the development of the AAVSO APAS photometric catalog and database of more than 6 million stars covering over 99% of the sky with magnitudes ranging from seven to 17. This database allows simplified reduction and transformation of photometric observations. Perhaps in an unforeseen use of the APAS database, Don Selly was just mentioning this earlier, astro imaging, uh, imagers routinely use it to color balance their images. Uh, we're privileged to have Arnie, a true friend, friend and supporter of our community, present to HAS. So Arnie, take it away. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Yeah, well, thank you, Joe. I'll go ahead and stop my share, let you share. And I just wanted to let folks know if you have any questions for Arnie as we get through the presentation, please use the chat feature within Zoom and we'll go ahead and queue those up for Arnie at the end of the presentation. All right. Things prepared here. And there we go. All right, so um, thank you very much for inviting me to your club, uh, to speak to your club. Well, the formal name of the observatory is now the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, uh, rightfully honoring Vera Rubin, who was a great astronomer. Uh, I've known it for 20 years plus as LSST. And so I'll use both names in this presentation interchangeably. The last time I was in Houston was nearly 30 years ago when my wife was researching the woodlands as an example of a sustainable community for her master's degree in uh, landscape architecture. I hope to get back someday. Um, that being said, there actually is a connection between LSST and Houston. And I'll highlight that in, in a few minutes. So what is LSST? Well, it first started off as the Dark Matter Telescope in about 1996. Uh, Tony Tyson and Roger Angel uh, collaborated and came up with this unique design um, that they thought that they could make. And they proposed it to the community. And it was actually uh, picked up by uh, one of the decadal surveys not too long after that. So the acronym LSST originally stood for Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, and that was uh, created in about 2001. Uh, Large Aperture Synoptic Survey Telescope is another uh, perturbation of that. And when the observatory was renamed the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, then they sort of changed the acronym to the Legacy Survey of Space and Time. But nonetheless, you just use LSST and people understand. The telescope itself is being renamed uh, the Simoni Survey Telescope uh, because of a substantial $20 million private donation. Um, and then there were also some substantial donations from Bill Gates, uh, Wayne Rosing, Smith and a few other people. So the telescope itself is an 8.4 meter aperture telescope and is designed to survey the Southern sky for uh, you know, planetary things like near earth asteroids as well as transients. And the website is shown here. This is the primary website. They have another one called the um, LSST cooperation or something like that.org. But if you go to lsst.org, which is the easy one, uh, you can find your way from there. The 
telescope itself was recommended by the 2000 Decadal Survey of Astronomy and Astrophysics. Uh, and after it was recommended, the concept was uh, sort of approved by a large group of people in 2001. A corporation was created containing most of the national facilities that people are familiar with, NOAO, National Computing Center uh, for Supercomputer Applications, Aura, things like that. And then in, in 2006, a uh, mountain in Chile called Cerro Pachon was chosen as the site. Uh, there are a couple other telescopes there. I'll show you that, that in a minute. 2008, everything really got started by these major private grants that were sufficient to buy the mirror blanks and start some of the uh, uh, grinding of the mirrors. And then in 2010, the next decadal survey considered LSST as the highest priority ground-based instrument, which was a major thing because then that uh, uh, prompted NSF to go ahead and fund the project. Uh, it's done in an annually basis, but at the end of construction, which is coming soon, about $473 million will have been spent through NSF towards the uh, observatory. The mountaintop itself was leveled in 2011, but construction didn't start for until about four years after that. In addition to the observatory and the telescope, the other major component of this is the camera, and the Department of Energy has, is the one who, who has funded that camera to the tune of $165 million. So if you think of your own CCD camera or CMOS camera, this is $165 million worth of camera. The first light is scheduled for sort of February of 2023 with their uh, commissioning camera. And it's been delayed a number of years by COVID-19 and just normal construction delays. But uh, uh, this figure actually looks pretty solid by now. The, one of the um, critical paths for the facility is the mirrors. And I'll show you why in, in the next couple of slides. The, Mirror itself is done by the spin casting technique that was pioneered by the U University of Arizona Steward Observatory Mirror Lab uh, back in the uh, early 90s, I guess, is when it's uh, created some of its first mirrors. Uh, the casting of this particular mirror started in March 2008 and was finished in July of 2008. So sort of a three month process to actually do the casting of the mirror. Uh, the grinding started in a couple months later in September, and then it took three years for that grinding to actually be completed. After the mirror was finished, it was tested and then stored at a facility in Tucson at the airport uh, until the uh, site itself was ready for acceptance of the mirror. So in 2019, the mirror was trucked to Tucson, excuse me, trucked to Houston which is where the connection with LSST comes into play. It was then shipped to Chile by going through the Panama Canal and was trucked up to the summit in May of 2019. The secondary mirror is uh, ultra low expansion glass from Corning. The blank was created and then stored at Harvard for, in 2009 until such time as sufficient funds were available which was 2014 when NSF started funding the project. And then that grinding and polishing was completed about four years later. So the location of the facility is sort of central Chile. The Eastern boundary of Chile is the Andes mountains and everything to the West of that basically is very dry. And so uh, it's an excellent spot for astronomy, and that's why most of the major observatories are in Chile. The um, actual location is, like I said, Serra Pachon, and it's located near La Serena, Chile. Notice that it is about as far south of the equator as Houston is north, and then in longitude, it's roughly the longitude of Boston. So it's about two hours, hour and a half east of Houston. Uh, it's kind of surprising. You sort of think of South America as being right underneath 
uh, Mexico and so on, but it isn't, it's over to the east. The telescope is at about 8,700 feet uh, on this mountain ridge. And the whole observatory complex is about 300 miles north of Santiago. To get to it, you fly from Miami to Santiago for the most part. And then you take a domestic flight from there up to La Serena, and then about a two hour van ride from uh, the headquarters there to the uh, actual observatory site. Uh, so along a, a dirt road that's not too bad, but it's, it's a long dusty ride. This is an artist's rendition of the telescope itself. And you can see that, yeah, it's 8.4 meter diameter primary mirror, but it's a very squat design. And uh, this is largely due to the fast uh, focal ratio of the telescope. It's f1.2 with an 8.4 meter mirror. Notice that the secondary uh, mirror up here, a uh, secondary mirror and actually the uh, CCD camera itself is supported by four extremely rigid uh, spiders. And that's because there's a lot of weight sitting up there. The secondary mirror is over three mirrors and meters in diameter, and the camera itself weighs several thousand pounds. And so you have to support it very carefully. So here is the, the mirror design. And you can see that the primary mirror, like I said, is 8.4 meters, uh, about f1.2. The light then goes up to the secondary mirror, which is a convex uh, mirror, 3.4 meters in diameter, F1. Comes back down to a tertiary mirror, which is five meters in diameter, and then up to a three element uh, lens corrector, of which uh, the final element, this L3, is the entrance window to the CCD doer itself. This, because it has such a huge uh, tertiary mirror there, five meters in diameter. The uh, telescope loses a bit of its aperture. It's really equivalent to like a 6.7 meter telescope operating at f1.2. The um, image quality is predicted to be about two tenths of an arc second. Uh, as you can see, the spot diagrams over here, so right on axis. It has a very small uh, spot size for the uh, uh, predicted star size. By the time you get off to the edge of the field of view at 1.75 degrees, so it's a 3.5 degree full field, uh, the images are larger than they are right on axis, but substantially less than kind of the typical uh, scene that is expected up on a Sarah Pachon, which is about 0.7 arc seconds a lot better than you get from the ground. You can see that these lenses are huge. The first entry lens, L1, is 1.55 meters in diameter. You think of the Yerkes uh, refractor has a one meter diameter lens, and they thought that was about as big as you could go in for an astronomical element. And here is 1.55. The filters are 30 inches in diameter. So they're huge filters. The entrance window to the uh, CCD is this third element of the corrector at essentially uh, 0.72 meters, and so almost 30 inches in diameter as well. So this is huge, uh, something you're just not really prepared to see. I like this graphic uh, a lot because it shows all of the big telescopes uh, that have been created over the last couple decades, as well as some of those that are proposed. The one that's gray in the background is the one that was called the overwhelmingly large telescope. It's been canceled, but it was going to be 100 meters in diameter. The two that are being built are the extremely large telescope, which is about 42 meters in diameter, the 30 meter telescope, that, which is a US uh, project, and then you can see all these sort of eight meter, six and a half meter class telescopes. These are all ones where it's a monolithic mirror and those are done with the spin casting method as opposed to the hexagonal tile uh, variety of some of the bigger telescopes. And then down here in the center is the LSST uh, profile. And you can see that that secondary and tertiary mirror 
take a big hunk out of the center of this thing. So it just looks like an annulus. And that's why it's only 6.7 meters effective diameter. Still a very large telescope, but not the same as some of these others that uh, have been produced or are in the near future. This is an artist's concept of what the observatory itself looks like. You can see the telescope over here in its dome with all kinds of ventilation. That's the uh, current way of thinking of how to improve the dome scene in, in large observatories. Uh, there is an elevator over here, which goes down to a support building. And this is where the illuminizing of the, the primary mirror actually takes place is down over here. So everything is done on the mountain once the mirror is, is on the mountain. Just to show you that it actually does exist in reality. This is the crane uh, lowering the top end assembly into the, uh, the dome of the observatory. This is looking kind of to the, uh, let's see, this is looking to the south. And you, well, actually, no, I, I take that back. It's looking to, sort of to the northeast because this is the ridge for Cerro Pachon. This is looking a little bit to the left of that. So you're actually looking along the ridge. This is almost a true north. You can see the, the main observatory here. This is an auxiliary telescope that I'll talk about in a second. This is the Gemini eight meter telescope and the SOAR four meter telescope, which are the other big telescopes on Cerro Pachon. And out here in the background, you can actually see the Andes. These are mountains that are generally about 19, 20,000 feet. Uh, they're really fun to fly over. They, they form the border between Chile and Argentina. So if you want to fly to Buenos Aires or something like that, it's this flight that goes straight up to about 30,000 feet and then back down again in about half an hour. Now this is uh, showing you the auxiliary telescope a little bit better. It's part of the LSST system. This is the telescope that actually does all of the atmospheric characterization. So instead of doing extinction measurements and things like that with the 8.4 meter telescope, it's all done with a much smaller telescope on the, on the uh, facility, but uh, and close to it, so that you get the same kind of uh, uh, atmospheric effects. You can see the road here, it goes across here. And then if you go off to the right, this road then goes back up the mountain over to CTIO. They're about, I think they're about 12 miles apart. Here's the auxiliary telescope. This telescope was donated by Edgar Smith. Uh, it used to be on Kitt Peak and then uh, uh, was refurbished and put down in, in Chile. It's a 1.2 meter telescope. It's going to have a low resolution, resolution spectrograph rather than an imaging system so that you get uh, atmospheric characteristics characterization in multiple wavelengths at the same time. Now LSST, as I showed earlier, is like $680 million. So it's very expensive. And that's just the, the money coming in basically from NSF and the Department of Energy. There's all kinds of in-kind contributions and so on. So it's really probably a billion dollar facility when you count everything up. And because of that, there's all kinds of documentation on the web, tons of pictures in the photo gallery at the LSST website, and a whole variety of YouTube videos, things like early construction uh, videos showing the blasting on the top of the, of the mountain, uh, generic spin casting uh, videos to show you the, the process, uh, melting the glass, lifting the lid, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, if you have a chance, go take a look at those videos. Joe says that these things are, the, the presentation is going to be, uh, is being recorded and will be made available. And so you can pick up these links once uh, that uh, uh, recording is made, or you can just go over and do a search on LSST on YouTube and you'll come across almost all of those. Now the mirror itself is part was uh, spin cast at the U of A facility, and this is the process of 
of creating the mold necessary to, to do that spin casting, you have all these ceramic cores, which do the light weighting. So basically what's going to happen is that the glass, uh, once it melts and with the uh, uh, whole oven rotating, it forms a parabola, which is what you want. And all the uh, liquid glass then fall, uh, flows in between all of these hexagonal cores to give you a honeycomb structure. And then the remaining glass forms a surface, which is only a couple inches thick. So it's a way of not only lightweighting the mirror, but also forming the basic parabola right off the beginning so you don't have to grind as much. Otherwise, you're grinding tons and tons of glass and it takes forever. It takes four years as it is. So it's, it's uh, not exactly simple, but this is a huge improvement and is why all these mirrors that you saw in that previous graphic are all 8.4 meters in diameter. That's because that's the biggest ones that they can spin cast in this facility. So here they're putting the molds down, the hexagonal cores down in the mold. There's about a thousand of these that are put down and they're all done by hand. Afterwards, all the glass is loaded. This is O'Hara E6 bore silicate glass. And it's basically in chunks about the size of a softball. And 26 tons of that glass has to be put into the mold. And it's all done by hand. You can see them doing it here. So it takes months just to do that one step. Then the entire uh, mold. Uh, uh, oven is rotated. Uh, it doesn't rotate as fast as is shown here, but you get the basic idea. Uh, there's a cover that's put over the top to create the entire oven. There are heating elements inside which bring the glass up to about 1200 degrees centigrade, where it liquefies, flows down through the uh, gaps in the hexagonal cores, and then uh, after everything is liquefied and uh, in the basic parabolic, parabolic shape, then it, the oven is slowly brought back up to uh, room temperature. It takes about three months to cool before you can lift the lid and see the, how the mirror actually turned out. Afterwards, they uh, pull it out of the oven, they power wash the uh, ceramic cores away, and then they go into the, the grinding and, and polishing of the mirror. This is the completed mirror before it was uh, ground and polished. And some of the people that were associated with the project itself, uh, and you can get a feel for just how big this mirror is. It's just huge and it's an incredibly precise mirror. Here's the mirror after it's been ground and polished. And so now you can see the uh, uh, M1 primary part, which is that big annulus. And then inside of that is this five meter secondary, excuse me, five meter tertiary mirror. Um, there's a central hole that's used for various things, but the camera doesn't go down below that. The camera is actually sitting up at prime focus. Here's the mirror being brought up the mountain, up, up that road that I showed you in a previous thing with the partially completed uh, LSST observatory here, Gemini and SOAR again. And you can see that it's very large. There, the complications were going through some of the tunnels that they had to uh, go through. There was one uh, between the uh, port of entry in Chile and the mountain top, for example. This is 8.4 meters in diameter, and that uh, uh, that tunnel was only about nine meters in, uh, across, so it just barely fit. Here's the tertiary, the one, two, secondary mirror. Uh, the big convex mirror, largest one that, ha that has ever been made, 3.4 meters in diameter. Uh, this one's a solid mirror. It's been lightweighted a bit on the backside to uh, bring the total weight of the mirror down to about 1,300 to 1,500 pounds. It's made out of Corning ultra low expansion glass. This mirror was uh, created in the U.S., sent to France, brought back to the U.S., brought back to Chile when it was completed. So they move around depending on the facility. The camera itself is the largest camera that's ever been created. 
You can see this based on sort of the typical person size. Um, the um, uh, first and second lenses really don't show up very well here. You can see the filter with the sensor array uh, at the focal plane behind it. And then you have all this stuff behind. So there's the cryostat, which contains focal plane and the electronics for running the, the sensors. And then all the computers and other miscellaneous uh, electronics and power supplies and everything else sit in back of it. So it's a very large, very heavy uh, unit, which actually goes into uh, the hole in the uh, uh, secondary mirror and is supported there. Here's the uh, front entry mirror or L1, excuse me, what am I saying? Front entry lens. This is L1. A meter and a half across fused silica. Um, this is the give you a physical size of the filters. You think of the filters that you have in your uh, imaging camera, and then look at the size of this filter. Very expensive and impressive that they could make them at all uh, at this size. The focal plane array is again one of the largest that was ever been constructed. This is a mock-up that uh, Suzanne Jacoby is, is holding up, primarily to show you the size compared to a human and the size compared to the full moon. And you can see that it does cover a very substantial area of sky. It's about 10 square degrees of sky. It's covered by this uh, sensor array. Here's the actual sensor array in the actual camera. And you can see, uh, all of the uh, uh, individual CCDs in here, these are 4K by 4K by 10 micron CCDs. Uh, there's 189 of those in that focal plane. There's no atmospheric dispersion corrector, and they use six filters uh, in the survey that are brought in through an interesting swapping mechanism because. Uh, you can't put in a filter slide or a filter wheel when you're sitting at prime focus. Uh, here's where they're cooling the camera down. This is without the corrector lenses down here other than L3, which is the entrance window to the doer. And you can see all the support electronics and everything else associated with the camera. So the camera wasn't quite ready and they wanted to do commissioning tests with the telescope. So a commissioning camera has been made, contains nine CCDs instead of the 189, uh, only 144 megapixels, uh, but the uh, full final camera that you saw earlier has 21 of these nine CCD modules. But everything else is, is as it will be in the final telescope. The three element correcting uh, optics, the filter changer, the full aperture shutter, uh, things like that are going to be uh, included in this uh, commissioning phase of the, of the system, which will take place starting at the end of this year, sort of November, December of this year, and then um, the full camera will be put on shortly after that. Here's that commissioning camera with, camera with its nine uh, CCDs. And um, you have to remember that this was kind of developed 10 years ago, for the most part. It's almost as bad as a spacecraft mission, where you spend your entire career developing uh, such a uh, system. And so these were the best CCD sensors that were available in sort of 2010 or there arounds. 144 megapixels involved here. And as a point of reference, QHY is currently selling their 411 camera, which has a Sony 150 megapixel sensor, one single sensor that uh, sort of has the same number of pixels, just much smaller pixels than the 10 micron ones that are in, in the LSST camera. All right, so enough on the construction and how the, the telescope is put together. Uh, I would like to start in on some of the science. 
regarding LSST. It's primarily a U.S. project. And as you can see, you know, the $680 million is, is entirely U.S. funds. Chile gets a part of that uh, operation because it's, that's, they're the host for the telescope. And then France and the UK have joined in on the collaboration. There was a project science team that constructed the telescope. There's a science advisory committee, which sort of uh, is going to be used for uh, determining what science has done with the, with the telescope. And then there are 37 institutional members. So these are universities and places like Las Cumbres that have uh, joined in along with lots of international affiliates and about a thousand collaboration individual scientists that are members of the uh, collaboration. And they're divided into sort of eight or nine groups. And you can see the kind of uh, science that each one of the groups is, is planning on doing. And they all collaborated on creating this thing that's called the science book. It's a 600 page book of proposed science with LSST various projects from solar system to, to uh, beginning of time type stuff and gravitational wave astronomy and you, you name it. Over 200 authors were involved in writing the book and you can download the PDF of that book. I actually have a hard copy of it. So here are the science, the main science goals for LSST to look at dark energy and dark matter, which is why DOA is, is involved. Um, Near-Earth asteroids and, and Kuiper Belt objects, transient uh, astronomical events, which is uh, my interest. So gamma ray burst afterglows, novae, supernovae, things of that sort. And then down there is one of the optical counterparts to gravi gravitational wave events, just like the 2017 event where they actually found a, an optical source. They're expecting uh, LSST with its 10 degree field of view, 10 square degree field of view to be able to be uh, a major player in that game. And then with any kind of new facility, you're going to have lots and lots of serendipitous discoveries. The baseline observing strategy for LSST, once it starts doing its science operations in about a year, is that it takes two 15 second exposures uh, at each um, position, in each pointing in the sky. So it takes a total of 39 seconds per field by the time you take the uh, 30 seconds worth of exposures, the five seconds of readout, uh, and then uh, moving and settling to the next field. So every 40 seconds, basically, they go to a new field and take a new set of exposures. And you think, 30 seconds worth of exposure won't get you very deep, but it does. It gets you almost down to 25th magnitude when you're dealing with a telescope of this size. So this basic cadence is going to continue for the lifetime of the survey, which is about 10 years. So it's going to scan 18 square degrees of sky repeatedly with each year having about 200,000 exposures and about 825 visits to each spot in the sky. But those 825 visits are divided between the various filters that they might use. And so if you take six and divide it into 825, that means maybe 100 or 150 visits to uh, each spot in the sky. During a single night, they're not going to change filters very often because it takes two minutes to do that. And the actual final cadence is still being discussed and simulated. And so after the first suite of uh, science observations, they'll probably redecide what kind of observations uh, observing strategy uh, is best suited for the kinds of science that they want to do. And there's competing needs. I mean, people who are looking at gal uh, galaxies at the beginning of time or uh, gravitational lensing are wanting very long, deep exposures. And the people who are dealing with uh, near-Earth near -earth asteroids want them very short. So there's got to be a mix somewhere down the line. And there's lots of constraints to all of this. If you want to do photometric redshifts so that you don't need necessarily spectroscopy in order to tell, say, what the redshift is of the uh, distant uh, supernova, 
then you have to do visits in each filter in order to get the sort of spectral response coarse spectroscopy in order to get the photometric redshift. Uh, supernovae, because they are continually changing, require frequent and deep images. And if you're dealing with the, the full moon, then you need to work in the red. And then about 10% of the time will be dedicated to specific projects, like deep fields in specific areas of the sky. In operation, a typical observatory this size costs about 10% of the construction uh, value of the telescope. So if it's a $680 million facility, you kind of expect $68 million a year will be necessary in order to run it. Data management consumes about $37 million a year of that budget. The images after they've been taken are sent to a data facility at the National Center for Supercomputing uh, Applications over a dedicated 100, megab 100 gigabit per second link. So 10 gigabytes every second get transferred to uh, this uh, facility. And at that facility, they go and um, calibrate all the images and find all the sources on there and compare each of the sources that they find each of, to uh, a, a known catalog. And anything that's changed in brightness or in position uh, generates an alert. And the prompt alerts are scheduled to occur within 60 seconds of the exposure. These have no proprietary period. They're going to be publicly, publicly available. But there's going to be hundreds of alerts per second uh, several million of these alerts per night, at least at the beginning, until the uh, reference catalog has uh, been updated with uh, LSST data. In addition to that, there are daily products, which are like the nightly images, all of the uh, images that were taken on any given night, which can be 500 or 1,000, and then the source catalogs of every object that were found on those images. And then once a year, they will go back and reprocess everything, generate light curves of all the stars, find all the solar system objects, uh, do image stacks in order to go deeper, and so on down the line. You're talking uh, several petabytes of uncompressed data per year from this facility. So petabyte is the next one, the next order of a thousand beyond terabyte. And so if you've got a three terabyte drive on your computer, just think of this, that is, you know, a thousand times more data per year coming in from this facility. For a single, single pair of images, you get down to about R of 24. And then when you stack the images, you get about three magnitudes fainter. While the prompt alerts are going to be public immediately, the full data images, et cetera, aren't going to be public for about two years. So those alerts that are generated every night, LSST is going to provide just a simple alert broker, which basically says just broadcasts out to the world every alert that it that uh, it creates, and that's about 700 gigabytes of data per night, which is way too much for anybody to deal with. So the first thing that happens is that there are nine community brokers which take those raw alerts from LSST and go and parse them to uh, find the ones that are of interest to specific communities. And be using artificial intelligence to do that because it has to be done for a million, ob a million alerts per night. And there's no way humans can actually do that. Uh, the number of alerts, like I said, will decrease as the source catalog improves and there actually is another video on the alert stream itself so you can look at that they will these alerts will start with the comcam op uh, operations but because it's the first time for that facility there will be substantial latency you won't get 60 second alerts it may be several hours before you actually get an alert on a specific uh, transient event So the limitations of this kind of a facility, 
of course, cloudy nights are going to be difficult to use because you're dealing with 10 square degrees of sky. So clouds can come over part of the field of view. And uh, then the, that area is fainter than the rest of the field of view. And so how do you correct for something like that? The moon not only causes scattering in the sky, but it's also going to have scattering off of things like those big spiders on the telescope. So it's going to be a major effect. And that means then that you aren't going to go as deep in uh, moonlit skies, or you're going to have to go to the far red, you know, the Z or Y filter in order to reduce the scattering. It won't look much north of the celestial equator. So everything will be at declination zero or south of there, uh, primarily due to extinction. And there are a couple of systems running in the north that uh, would sort of compete with it anyway. You can only do sort of one visit per night. So that means that if it's a fast transient, uh, you're not gonna be able to follow it very well, which is why ground-based follow-up from other facilities is, is uh, crucial to LSST's success. And again, because you can, uh, you'll be observing in one filter one night and another filter the next time that it gets to it, you can only see a transient in one pass band initially. So how, how can you classify what kind of a transient it is? There's gaps between the sensors. There's the cumbersome cha filter changing mechanism. And then this last point, lower th satellites are gonna be a big issue. Things like Starlink. Uh, it is gonna impact LSST more than probably any other telescope system that is currently envisioned because it's such a wide field. So 30 to 50% of twilight images are going to be impacted by these uh, communication satellites. Very bright objects such as these satellites can yield not only saturation in the detec detector, but you get crosstalk and ghosting between detectors. So it can actually ruin the entire image. SpaceX uh, is introducing methods to decrease the brightness of the satellites. They started out at like fifth magnitude and that was just almost impossible to deal with. They're trying to push them to seventh or uh, faint magnitude or even fainter so that the impact may just be the satellite trail itself within the image. Since you're doing two exposures per field, part of the reason for the two exposures is to reduce cosmic rays so that you can get rid of them. You can also then reduce uh, the satellite trail within the image, as long as you realize that you're also then moving anything else that trails in the image, such as uh, a near-Earth asteroid. So it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out. Now, talking about how amateurs get involved in this, one of the ways is through the Education and Public Outreach or EPO goals. Um, they're going to be reduced. They're going to be um, providing some of the output from LSST to content developers at Planetarium, uh, partnering with Zooniverse to classify objects, and even releasing some of the data to uh, uh, classrooms. And so you have access to the data, just not as, as much of the data as you would if you were a scientist with data rights. I worked with the EPO uh, working group for uh, a number of years and it, this particular aspect of the uh, project is primarily designed for sort of informal science education. And it's not, uh, you know, where you are providing real scientific data support and follow-up of, of transients that are occurring. So how can amateurs actually get involved? Well, part of that is you remember that the system can pick up objects as faint as 24th magnitude in a single exposure. But because CCDs have a, a limited dynamic range, that means that anything brighter than about 18th magnitude gets saturated. And once it's saturated, you really don't know how bright it is. So if you filter just on all the bright saturated objects, for example, on that alert stream, you get a set of objects for which LSST can't provide any information. 
And so that's where follow-up from amateurs could be uh, very uh, useful. If things are, are bright enough, you can actually do spectroscopy of some of the more unusual objects of that uh, alert stream. You can contact, say, institutional members, people who are uh, perhaps at a university that's near you. Uh, if you go to this link, it actually tells you who is the uh, uh, person to contact at each one of those institutions regarding LSST. And so you can uh, uh, gain access to professional researchers who may need uh, uh, follow-up activities for their particular project. You can also, if you want to just do it on your own, one way is to look into the Las Cumbres Mars project, which is making alerts really simple, uh, which is a way in which you can actually get those alerts and get them onto your robotic telescope and go after the events uh, in near real time. There's also a uh, LSST community forum, so you can go over and actually get into the forum groups and learn a little bit about, about it. Uh, there are a number of you know, there's like a thousand scientists that have data rights within the US. If you look for one of those, again, that's a person who you could partner with. And, you know, on the other direction is that they are always hiring at LSST. There's like 12 or 15 jobs that are currently on their hiring list. If you have the right kinds of skills, maybe you want to go work for the project. We're hoping that in the future, the AVSO will also get involved in the variable stars found in the uh, uh, alert stream. Uh, this is waiting on uh, getting a new executive director for the AVSO and seeing whether he or she is interested in uh, pursuing this path. But that's another option, so keep an eye out on the uh, AVSO webpage. So, in summary, LSST is a very innovative system. It had a lot of critical paths that um, NSF, for example, was very hesitant on supporting until they actually knew that the uh, system would work. And when it does come online, it's going to greatly expand our knowledge of transient objects because it just goes so faint and so quickly. It's going to be operational within the year. So it's not like it's something way in the future. If you want to work with LSST, you got to think about it right now. And that data fire hose is something that, that every professional that I've talked to is really scared of. I mean, it's great. You're going to have all this neat data to play with, but how do you sift through it? There's going to be uh, extensive need for amateur follow-up. And so I think that the professionals are not connecting with the amateur community as uh, tightly as they should, because that's where they're going to get a lot of follow-up information. They just don't have that kind of facility time for their own telescopes. And in almost real time, you do gain access to some of the data for schools for using in classroom or for your own per, uh, personal research. And so again, there's my email address if you have any questions and the main site uh, to go to for LSST uh, or the Rubin Observatory as you uh, wish to uh, refer to it. And uh, with that, I'd like to close and thank you for allowing me to present. Oh, wonderful presentation, Artie. Thank you so much. Uh, I learned a lot about this. And, and quite frankly, I, I'm almost embarrassed to say this, probably probably hadn't heard about LSST in a number of years until Don had brought it up as, as part of this presentation. And as I was uh, starting to do some reading about it, I just thought, you know, there's going to be a flood of data, like you said, and a great opportunity for people who are really interested in these citizen science opportunities uh, to contribute to this. So, um, Arnie, if you're okay with it, we had a, a few folks ask questions that uh, you know I was hoping you might be able to help answer. Is, is that okay with you? Sure. Okay. Well, the first uh, question we got was from Bill Spitzeri. Bill, Bill, do you want to come off of mute and ask your question? 
Yes, thank you. Uh, well, terrific presentation, that's for sure. Uh, early on, you talked about that second observatory that was right next door to LSST. And I think you said that it was going to be involved with atmospheric characterization. And I was thinking maybe, um, what do you call it, adaptive optics, but I didn't know what that was referring to. Could you describe what that means? Yeah, no, there's no adaptive optics involved in the auxiliary telescope. It primarily just has a very low resolution spectrograph mounted on it. And so all it's doing is measuring the brightness of the uh, uh, of objects in the basically in the direction where LSST is observing on a particular night. And it tries to characterize the atmosphere, sort of get the uh, variation of extinction with wavelength in the atmosphere so that it does all the calibration, you know, zero pointing and, and uh, extinction coefficients and things like that, that would be normally used in photometric processing. There are a number of other uh, ancillary instruments that do uh, atmospheric sounding. So you get an idea of the water vapor content and things like this. And so they're trying to characterize the atmosphere very thoroughly uh, for the use of LSST so that uh, the photometry that they get off of it is as precise as possible. So does that mean LSST won't be using adaptive optics at all? That is correct. It wow. uses the native scene, which is like seven tenths of an arc second. And I'm it, sure it's nice there uh, for sure. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, if you've ever been in a site where seven tenths of an arc second scene, it's just it's it's astounding. I mean, the most of the ground-based observatories, you know, like you would get in the Houston area, are two or three arc second images, and they, they look great. And every now and then, you know, you get this period of good scene, and you get to see you know the bands on Jupiter and things like that. But when you get to a huge telescope, you know, uh, anything larger than about two meters in diameter, you, the those periods of good scene just disappear because it all gets averaged out because the mirrors are so large that they average out all the atmospheric oh, yeah. distortion. Yeah. And so once you can do that, though, at a good site, like four tenths of an arc second at uh, the VLT and seven tenths of an arc second here, um, it just means that all night long, it's seven tenths of an arc second. And so they don't need atmospheric, uh, they don't need adaptive optics for this. Wow. And they couldn't make an adaptive optics system big enough anyway. Incredible. Okay, great, thank you. All right, that's a great question, Bill, and uh, an even better answer, Arnie, thank you so much. Uh, I know Richard Wilborn had a uh, question that he'd asked. Richard, do you wanna come off of mute and ask your question? Yeah, hi, this is Rich. Hey, I'm thinking about uh, when we talk about big projects around the world, you know, we have bridges and giant buildings, and, but those things are done by the dozen. And these giant telescopes are really unique objects. So uh, are there very many companies in the world that have the expertise? Uh, I've never heard of one that had a problem in construction, but there just can't be that many people in the world that can do this, can there? No, for for example, the spin casting mirrors are almost exclusively done at the Stewart Observatory. And so that's why, like I said, they're limited to 8.4 meters in diameter, but the large binocular telescope has two of those. Uh, Magellan Telescope has a bunch of six and a half meter tele, uh, mirrors that are done there. So that facility uh, is the only one that can build those kinds of mirrors. And they have a limited space, and so they can only, you know, do a handful of those mirrors at any one time. So there is a, a bottleneck for large, single monolithic mirrors. The bigger telescopes like Keck and uh, uh, the 30 meter telescope all use hexagonal segments that are sort of one to two meters in size. And there are two or three companies that can do those segments. because they are smaller pieces of glass just need computer generated polishing in order to be able to handle them because each of the mirrors is, has a slightly different figure because of the, of the shape of the parabola. But as far as the mechanics of the telescope, oh, there's gotta be probably six to a dozen uh, engineering firms that will build such a structure and so it's a small number of firms, but you have to remember it's also a small number of telescopes too. So for instance, right now there's three 
major telescopes that are under construction. This LSST, the 30 meter telescope and the uh, uh, ELT are about the only ones that are really being produced right now. And so the available teams are, are busy and they have to, and if you wanted another telescope, you'd have to schedule it in six to 10 years in the future. So it's limited, but luckily the, the number of uh, telescopes that need to be created are also equally limited just because they're very expensive. Wonderful. Thanks for that question. And I know uh, Don Selly also had a question as well. Don, are you out there still? Sure. Um, Arnie, I uh, uh, remember what I went, was at Texas Star Party maybe 2013 or uh, thereabouts when I saw the first presentation about the LSST. And I remember thinking to myself at the time, wow, this is like drinking, uh, you know, uh, water from a fire hose, which you alluded to. And how, you know, how many people is it going to take to, um, to, to actually handle this data? And I know there's a lot that's going to be done by AI, but still the AI has to be, has to uh, be taught as well. Um, your presentation tonight made me think I wasn't even close to understanding how big the fire hose was back then. Has anybody ever done an estimate about how many people are going to be needed to just train the AI or to try and keep the data sort of uh, up to up to date? Uh, 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 any ideas? Um, you can sort of look at it by the size of the science collaborations for the uh, eight or nine different areas because those are the people who are actually doing the work necessary to to drink from the fire hose the the all the nsf money is only for construction and so there has been no money allocated for what do you do with the data after the telescope comes online and starts taking data and so that's the the big challenge right now. And there are some very smart people in, you know, like 40-ish universities that are working on this that are funded from various sources. I don't think many of them are through NSF because again, NSF doesn't want to fund the operation of the telescope, but they'll fund a science project with the telescope. And that science project may require a certain pipeline to gather the uh, alerts and filter them so that uh, they only look at the objects of interest. And so in that sense, that pipeline then could be used for other people who want to do the same thing. But my feeling is once that telescope turns on, uh, a lot of its initial data is just not going to be looked at or examined or anything else. It just goes into the database and Sometime in the future, somebody will figure out a way of looking at it. But right now, it's just going to get stored away. Because uh, I really think that's kind of the piece that's missing right now is what do you do with the data after it's been acquired? All right. Well, thank you. I, I, I'm not sure uh, uh, that uh, anybody maybe has an appreciation for the number of folks it's going to take. But I... Uh, it, it really, I appreciate your uh, presentation. And like I say, it really brought home to me how much data is going to be uh, uh, acquired by this uh, telescope. So it will be an embarrassment of riches. Mm -hmm. Very much so. So, in my professional life, I'm a technology strategist, and this is a, a problem that's not unique to this particular <laughs> project. I think most organizations in the world right now are gathering more data than they know what to do with, and it's just uh, really a problem that everybody's trying to get their uh, arms around. But uh, again, this is an opportunity for anybody who wants to get involved to do so, which is uh, different than some of the other issues that we see out there. Excellent. Thanks for that question, Don. Um, those were all of the questions that we had on the uh, chat. Does anybody else have any questions before we wrap up here tonight? If you want to come off of mute and ask those questions, feel free to do so right now. Just, just one thing. Um, is there a provision for keeping this data essentially forever? Because, you know, 100 years from now, they may say, where, where did that supernova come from? And uh, 
where does data like this go? You know, that's a really good question. If you look at how NSF handles proposals these days, one of the uh, areas that you have to address is what's called data management. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the review panels actually look at is, you know, uh, first of all, public access to the data because, you know, the NSF is funding it. And so they want to make sure that the public has access to the data. And secondly, is the longevity of the, of the database, the data archive. And in this particular case, one of the problems is that you're gathering several petabytes of data every year. The survey goes for 10 years. You're talking one to 300 petabytes of data. And that's a lot of hard drives. And then to be able to serve it up you know, in a huge database and be able to get access to an image that was taken, you know, five years into the, the uh, survey or something is, is really tough. And then, like you said, what happens 30 years down in the future? How do you both keep the data refreshed so that it's on the most current type of media? And how do you keep it available to the, the public? Because it's going to be expensive to maintain that kind of a database. And I think they're only thinking out 10 years. They say, you know, we'll kick the can down the road. We'll do everything we can to produce the best data possible and make it available for people over the 10-year life of the program. And then hopefully somebody with deep pockets will come along and fund the archive into the future. As far as I know, it has not been funded yet. You know, there's a consideration here because, uh, well, I'll, I'll age myself. I went back and tried to have a one-inch magnetic tape in CDC format read after 10 years. Mm -hmm. It was almost impossible. I only found a government lab at University of Georgia that could read it. And as far as I know, they're gone. <clears throat> and, you know, media changes. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that means then you got to take these hundred petabytes of data and transfer them on to something else. <laughs> Who knows Good in 10 luck. years, uh, that hundred petabytes might fit onto a USB stick. <laughs> oh yes. Yeah. I look forward to that. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> oh, you oh. wait. Good. Well, I, <laughs> okay. Any other questions for Arnie before we wrap up tonight? I think in 30 years, uh, perhaps also our AI will be a lot better, maybe do a better job of this. That's right. Yeah, right now the AI is not all that great. I've That's seen right. um, uh, automated classification of variable stars off of things like the Palomar, uh, excuse me, the Zwicky Transient Factory, which is using the, the Palomar 60-inch telescope and the uh, Palomar 48-inch. Um, and the stars that they classify as variable stars, they, they get it right about a third of the time. And the other two thirds are misclassified for one reason or another. And that's the best AI that's out there today. And so this facility, if it, if it only gets it right 30% of the time, uh, that's, you know, that means a lot of alerts coming down that are not the ones that you want to look at. And so AI is difficult and AI with only one pass band and one visit to a, an object is even harder. Yeah. Say so AI is only as good as the uh, supervised or unsupervised learning routines that you feed into the system. So absolutely. Yep. You know, this, this data is going to be very valuable. Uh, I hope they build a giant warehouse somewhere, and make a backup copy. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. As long as it doesn't end up like uh, the movie uh, In Search of the uh, Lost Ark, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Well, Arnie, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. I really appreciate your time. And, and, and Don, thank you for uh, arranging for Arnie to come meet with us tonight. Uh, I, I hope everybody walks away from this really inspired by all the great science that's going to be done by this observatory and uh, hope. Hopefully, we have a few members within the HAS 
who are willing to jump on board and help out with some of these data problems that are there and really contribute to these uh, efforts. So again, uh, Dr. Hendon, yeah. thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we do I, really I appreciate it. Yes. Jump real quick, uh, uh, Joe, and absolutely, say, uh, and give a thank you or shout out to Walt uh, Cooney, uh, who uh, uh, helped, uh, who's uh, worked with Arnie a lot in the past, and actually helped uh, make this possible. Absolutely, and you can see Walt there on camera. He's not by himself. Uh, Doug is next to him, and I've seen other people kind of waltz in and out. They're at the CKA party, a star party. I believe that's what the acronym is right now. Not to be mistaken for the uh, Chick-fil-A star party, which probably <laughs> doesn't exist. But <laughs> I'm just making that up. But uh, yeah, thank you very much, Walt, for uh, the suggestion and, and Don for, for uh, making this happen. And Dr. Hendon for joining us tonight and, and really sharing some wonderful uh, information with the rest of the group. So thank you. All right, and with that, I, I, we will close. Um, I say March meetings, or April meetings, or excuse me, May meetings. Uh, I should have changed the, the title there. But our next meeting uh, is our Thursday novice meeting, May 5th at 7 p.m. My apologies for not updating the, the title there. But uh, Thursday, May 5th is going to be our novice meeting, as we'd mentioned before. Uh, our guest speaker is going to be Spil Bill Spitziri, who's going to walk us through his trip to the uh, Kennedy Space Center. And then uh, the following day on Friday, May the 6th, it uh, looks like we're probably gonna be doing a, a remote meeting then as well. Maybe not at the, uh, the Mendenhall Center, but we'll make that decision in a few weeks. But uh, that meeting will happen on Friday, May 6th. And our guest will be uh, Dr. Christopher John, Johns Krull of Rice University, who's going to uh, discuss with us the evolution of stars. So it should be a really exciting presentation. And uh, I always say this, I finish off with this. If you're on any of the social media platforms, feel free to give us a follow and join in the discussions that we have there. Uh, this meeting will be recorded and uh, uploaded to our YouTube page. And as always, if you have any questions, concerns, comments, please send us an email to info at astronomyhouston.org. We love to get those emails. We love to interact with our members and other people in the public. And uh, that's the best way to do so there. And lastly, looking forward to seeing everybody who's going to be joining us at the Messier Marathon tomorrow night. If you can't do that, hopefully you, we will see you at the Texas Star Party. And if you're not going to join us then, then we'll see you in May. So have a great night, everybody. Really appreciate you joining us. Thank you again, Dr. Hendon. And you all stay safe. We'll see you soon. Thank mm -hmm. you.